Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Todd Schrader, and again, I've been asked to speak about uh, knee replacement surgery. So what I'm going to speak tonight to you about is about both partial and total knee replacement. So when we start talking about knee replacement, I think it's very important that I kind of go and review general anatomy for you so you can understand what I'm talking about. We'll talk about what is arthritis, conservative treatment, surgical treatment, and then what's new in joint replacement. So in the knee anatomy, the knee consists of three compartments. There's the medial compartment or the inside compartment of the knee, the lateral compartment of the knee, which is the outside compartment, and then the kneecap is the third compartment, which is called the patellofemoral joint. When we talk about partial knee replacements, we talk about replacing just one of these compartments. When we talk about a total knee replacement, we talk about replacing the entire knee, all three compartments. Cartilage, there are two types of cartilage in the knee. There's articular cartilage, which covers the end of the bone. And then there's the meniscal cartilage, which is a pad between the bone. This is a diagram of a normal knee. Imagine a patient is standing in front of you. <clears throat> the bone up here is called a thigh bone is the femur. The pink area right here is the articular cartilage covering the femur. This is the tibia or the shin bone, and the little bone off the side is called the fibula. This is a demonstration of the knee bent. You can see the nice smooth articular surface for gliding on the femoral bone. Again, the articular cartilage is in pink here on the tibia, and then the meniscal cartilage kind of circles around the edges of each side of, of the tibia. These provide some cushioning to the knee. There's also ligaments on both the medial and lateral side of the knee. With all knee replacement surgery, we always try to maintain these ligaments. For partial knees, we also maintain these two ligaments called the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. For a total knee, we always sacrifice the anterior cruciate ligament. The posterior cru cruciate ligament is sometimes sacrificed. This depends on the deformity of the knee and the surgeon's preference. <clears throat> now, deformity of a knee. The skeleton on the left shows a normal alignment of a knee and what the bones look like. As someone begins to wear out the medial compartment of the knee, they become more bow-legged, and this is what their knees look like. If a person wears out the lateral side of their knee, they become more knock-kneed, and this is how their knees look. What is arthritis? Well, basically, arthritis is just the wearing out of the articular cartilage that covers the bone. And once the bone is exposed, this causes pain. When I try to explain this in the office to patients, I always talk about the tire on your car. The articular cartilage is like the rubber on your tire. The steel belt that's below the, the rubber is like the bone. And when the rubber wears out and the bone's exposed, you're going to have a flat tire. So when you look at a knee, this is an arthroscopy, arthroscopy of a knee. An arthroscopy is a small instrument about the size of a pencil that we can insert into the knee and look inside the knee. This is looking at the medial femoral condyle, so the thigh bone portion of the knee, and the white portion is cartilage, and that's how it should look. But you see this large defect, this kind of a beige pink area, that's exposed bone. That's very painful. Arthritis, there are two types of basic arthritis. There's osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear disease. As we get older, it just wears out. And then there's rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory or an autoimmune disease where your immune system actually makes antibodies against the synovial layer inside your knee that creates a, an inflammatory reaction inside your knee. This ends up destroying the entire joint, and because of this, these patients are poor candidates for a partial knee replacement. Now, osteoarthritis, probably the more common ones we see, again, as age and time goes, the knee wears out. There's also secondary forms of osteoarthritis where patients can have a fracture that's in the knee joint that causes an incongruity of the joint that can lead to arthritis. Osteonecrosis is a lack of blood flow to the bone, can also cause osteoarthritis. The two most common causes of osteonecrosis are um, uh, excessive alcohol use and chronic oral steroids. Most cases of osteonecrosis are actually what we call idiopathic, means we really don't know what actually has caused it. Septic arthritis, if someone gets an infection in the knee, can be a very um, significant destruction of the knee. And then post-meniscectomy, um, very common operation we do is to remove 
uh, meniscal tear. And by removing that meniscus, which is a cushion inside your knee, can lead to arthritis. In the old days, they used to open up these knees and take out the entire meniscus to treat these meniscal tears. They would see 10 to 15 years later that these patients would develop arthritis. Now we have an arthroscope that we can go in there and just remove the torn piece of tissue and try to maintain as much of the, of the meniscal cartilage as possible to try to avoid them developing arthritis. This is another arthroscopic view of a patient who has a meniscus tear. This is the femoral bone here. This is the tibial bone. You see the nice, smooth, articular surface. That's how it should look. This is the meniscus right here, and there's a torn meniscus way in the back of the knee. This piece is torn off here and flipped back to the knee. This shows my probe coming in here, and I'm delivering that piece of tissue between the knee. This was causes the knee to give out. This tissue gets caught between the two ends of the bone, and the knee buckles. So what I do is I trim that piece out, but I try to maintain as much of the meniscal cartilage as possible to hope, hopefully avoid any arthritis in the future. Symptoms of arthritis is usually pain with weight-bearing activities, swelling, and joint stiffness caused by bone spurs, which limits motion. This is an example of an x-ray of a normal knee. This is actually my right knee, okay? I'm standing here in front of you, all right? This is my thigh bone. Here's my shin bone. This is the actual joint. That gap between the bones is the articular cartilage that we do not see on the x-ray. This is what an arthritic knee looks like. You see the complete collapse of the joint space. This is a left knee, so this is a varus deformity of the knee. This will be the side view. You see these large bone spurs that have formed around the joint. This limits the motion of the knee. And this is the kneecap view or the patellofemoral view. And again, you see these large osteophytes on each side of the knee. Conservative treatment, usually we start with medications such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. This includes Motrin, Aleve. The problem with these medications is that chronically taken, they can cause stomach ulcers and they can also affect your kidney function. So we have developed these COX-2 inhibitors where the newer medications that have less effect on your GI system, this would include Mobic and Celebrex. Uh, these joints of both the hip and the knee are weight-bearing joints, so weight reduction is a very important part of treatment, of conservative treatment. Physical therapy has limited capacity to actually treat arthritis, in my opinion, just because as you exercise an arthritic joint, it just hurts more. Injections, uh, probably the most common one we give is a, a steroid or cortisone injection in the knee. Cortisone is the strongest anti-inflammatory we have. By injecting that into the knee, this reduces the inflammatory reaction in the knee and works quite well. The problem with cortisone is you can only get about three injections in a year, and the duration of this is very limited. We have no idea how long it's going to last per patient. It's kind of patient-specific. It can last a day, it can last weeks, and it can last months. Another type of injection is called hyaluronidate. It's a very thick, viscous fluid. I always equate this to like the oil to the engine. Your knee naturally has hyaluronate inside the knee. It's been approved by the FDA for treatment of osteoarthritis in 1997. Usually this consists of three injections in the knee once a week for three weeks. There is a product out there called Simvis-1 that you can inject one injection. That's all three injections in one syringe. The results are pretty much similar with both the three injections and the one injection. And these tend to last up to about six months. Another injection you may hear people talking about is platelet-rich plasma. What this is that we take blood from you and we spin it down in a centrifuge and we withdraw the platelets. The platelets have growth factors and has been shown to help some patients with osteoarthritis. The problem with this is this is very new technology and we really don't know how it works. And most insurance companies do not pay for this. Another possible treatment for conservative, I'm sorry, another conservative treatment is the unloader brace. What the unloader brace is trying to do is shift the weight from one side of the knee to the other side of the knee where there's good cartilage. So this is an example of a patient who would have a varus knee and arthritis on the inside of the knee. These straps here pull the knee kind of towards the knock knee position, towards the medial side, shifting the weight from the medial to the lateral side of the knee. Surgical treatments, there are some arthroscopic procedures we can perform for early stages of arthritis. Arthroscopic debridement has been shown to be a fairly poor treatment for this. The results of this long-term are very poor. You can go in and clean up the knee, maybe temporarily, but these patients, it's not treating the arthritis, it's trying to clean up some of the debris within the knee, maybe some of the mechanical symptoms of the knee. Pick arthroplasty or microfracture, you'll hear a lot of athletes are getting these microfracture techniques. 
What that entails is that you go into these arthritic knees and you actually drill a hole into the bone. What that does is it stimulates the bone marrow to form what's called fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is a combination of scar tissue and cartilage cells that are, are arranged from almost like stem cells in your bone marrow that come out and grow onto the surface. It's a very thin layer. It does not have the wear resistance as your normal cartilage. OATS is a, um, stands for osteoarticular transport system. This is for very isolated defects. We can take a dowel of cartilage and bone from a non-weight bearing portion of your knee and transport that into the defect. Again, these are for very small and isolated defects. This is an example of a patient, again, with an arthritic knee. This is the slide I showed you earlier with that big, large arthritic lesion involving the, the thigh bone portion right here. And what I did here is I drilled these holes here, and this is called the microfracture or the pic arthroplasty. Again, the thought is, is that some of these cells are going to grow out here and cover this area of the defect. High tibia osteotomies is a possible indication for younger patients who we feel are too young to undergo a joint replacement. What this entails is going in and cutting the bone and switching the weight bearing from the arthritic side to the non-arthritic side. There are two types of techniques called closing and opening wedge techniques. This is an example of what's called a closing wedge technique. What we do is if the patient is, has a varus deformity, arthritis on the inside of the knee, we take a wedge part of bone out the wedge would be wider on the lateral side. We shift the bone to the lateral side of the knee, and then we use a plate to help close this gap down and switch the weight from the medial to the lateral side of the knee. Opening wedge, we make this cut and we push the bone open. We have to bone graft this area right here, and again, we're switching the weight from the medial to the lateral side of the knee. Joint replacement. So we have two options for joint replacement. We have partial knees, are called unique apartment, and then we have total knee arthroplasties. Now, for a partial knee, what we do is we pretty much take a saw and we remove the arthritic area. And then we glue this metal cap on the end of the thigh bone. For the tibia, we do the same thing where we take a saw and we cut and remove this portion of the bone that's arthritic, maintaining the cruciate ligaments and the collateral ligaments. And then we glue the tibial base plate onto the tibia. This plastic locks into that tibial base plate. And this is what a partial knee looks like on a diagram. A total knee, we take, we remove the entire articular surface. As you see on this left, this will be the thigh bone portion, and, a, and this metal implant pretty much caps the end of the femur. The tibia, we cut perpendicular to the shaft there, and this metal base plate is glued into the tibia. The plastic, again, is locked into the metal base plate. And Depending on the surgeon, not all surgeons resurface the kneecap, but usually the kneecap is also resurfaced, and the back side of the kneecap is cut, and this plastic is glued to the back side, which articulates with the thigh bone. And this is what a diagram looks like of a total knee. Now, indications for total knee, we used to have these traditional indications um, for less active patients to get total knees because our implants were not that good in the past. Patients had to be over the age of 60, less than 200 pounds, low activity, minimal deformities of their knee, and they had to have intact ligaments. Today, we have a better understanding of implants and of the knee kinemax, and we're getting better results with this. And by doing this, we're able to do younger and more active patients. The surgical technique for this, when I do these procedures, I always put an arthroscope in the knee to check the knee. I make a smaller incision when I do a partial knee, and I want to make sure that the kneecap and the opposite compartment is still intact. If I do a partial knee and they have arthritis on the other side of the knee that I can't appreciate on my films, this patient is not going to do well. So the scope really gives me that information that I need. In about 5 to 10 percent of cases, I do have to convert this over to a total knee. This also gives me the opportunity when I scope the knee that I can look on the opposite side of the knee and look for meniscal tears that sometimes I find in about 15 percent of cases. And again, the partial knee does have a smaller incision, about a 4 to 5 inch incision. This is an example of a patient that has, this is his, oops, sorry about that. This would be the right and left knee. He has pretty much bookends here. This, he's got arthritis on the medial side of his knee. He's got the varus deformity. All of his pain is localized on the medial side of his knee. This is what the implant looks like on the x-ray postoperatively. You can see the metal implant here, tibial implant, and then there's a piece of plastic that's in between here. We have different thickness of the piece of plastic, so we can gauge and balance the knee so it fits just right. 
This is the lateral view of the knee. This example patient that has a valgus deformity or arthritis on the outside of the knee. And again, this is what the implant looks like when I replace the lateral side of the knee. And this will be the lateral view. This is an example of a patient who had a patellofemoral arthroplasty. Replaced the kneecap, the backside kneecap is replaced with a piece of plastic. And there's a metal implant that's put on the thigh bone portion. The advantages of a, t of a partial knee over a total knee is that you maintain your normal kinematics of the knee. All the ligaments are maintained in the knee. It has less complications, less blood loss, and the rehab is much quicker with a partial knee. post op these patients are full weight bearing. You get up the day of surgery. After surgery, we get you up and you put your full weight on it and you can walk on it. It's ready to go. CPM is kind of controversial right now. Some patients need it, some patients don't. I think it's very patient specific. We're actually involved in a study here of looking at possibly not using CPMs for certain patients. The average stay in the hospital for a partial knee is two days. For a total knee, it's three days. And usually full recovery for a partial knee is at six to eight weeks. For a total knee, it's 12 weeks or three months. What and it's CPM? continuous passive motion. Sorry about that. Pain is very common complaint for three months at night. The results of partial knees uh, shows very shows good to excellent results with this, and I think the key to getting a good result is picking the right patient. You have to find the patient that has that isolated compartment that's involved, and those are good patients. If patients have two or more compartments, they really need a total knee to get a good result. Uh, the 10-year survivorship, that means the implants are still in place after 10 years, is 92 to 98 percent. And converting this, uh, a partial knee to a total knee is like a patient undergoing a primary total knee. Here is a patient. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon. He placed this many years ago. It did very well for many years, but the plastic broke. So I took this patient in and converted this to a total knee. This will be the side view. Sometimes when I convert these from a partial to a total, there is some bone loss from taking that implant out. This demonstrates a patient who I had to actually put a wedge in on the medial side to make up for that bone loss on the medial side once I converted this to the total knee. I do usually use a stem down these to help further augment my fixation when I use a wedge. This example, a patient who we did a partial knee on did well for years, but then he started developing arthritis in his kneecap. But his medial side was doing great, but all his pain was in his kneecap area. So what I did is I just maintained his medial compartment and just replaced his patellofemoral joint. And that's the lateral view. Now the common question I get is, am I a good candidate for a partial knee? If I see a patient that comes in and points to one compartment, and then I look at an x-ray and all the arthritis is on the inside of the knee, that's a good patient for a partial knee. And again, if there's other compartments that are involved or the patient puts the whole hand over the knee, that's a total knee. So total knee replacement to shift gears. Um, this is when we resurface the entire knee joint. Crucial ligaments are removed. Um, we can sometimes maintain the PCL or the posterior crucial ligament. It does have better long-term results. And again, the recovery is three months. This is an example of what a total knee looks like. Again, we have the cap of the femur the tibia base plate with the stem and the plastic between her, that's the gap you see between the bones. This is the lateral view. Again, you see how we surface the kneecap. I cut the back half the kneecap off and, and glue a piece of plastic on the back kneecap, plastic between these two articular surfaces. The knee that I've been using that, um, that I think that I really like is called the Journey 2. I've been using this now for about six months, and I think it really is a different total knee than I've been using over the past 18 years. This is made by a company called Smith Nephew. Uh, you can look on their webpage to get more information about this. The reason why I like this knee is because I really think it replicates normal knee motion. A normal knee is not just a simple hinge where it bends. Actually, when the knee bends, it pivots off the medial side and has a posterior lateral rollback when it bends. Most knees that are conventional out there actually have what's called a paradoxical motion, where the knee actually, when the knee bends, it translates anterior. When this happens, it activates the quadricep muscles, so we have some abnormal firing of the quadricep muscles. So for this knee, I'm seeing better quadricep strength and gait, and I'm also seeing better knee flexion with these knees. This is an example of a patient who's two and a half weeks after a total knee. Most knees I see that would come in at two weeks, I want to make sure they have 90 degrees of flexion. 
This patient is just over two weeks and he has about 110 degrees of flexion. And this is the typical thing I'm now seeing with this knee that's different than the conventional knee. This knee also has something called Verilas technology. What that is is that XLPE means cross-link polyethylene. That's the plastic. What we're doing is by rating the plastic and cross-linking the molecules, we're making the plastic stronger. In addition, they have a metal called Oxinium. Oxinium is a metal that's almost like a ceramic that's very smooth. If you combine the denser plastic and a smoother metal, you get less wear. So this chart here shows the amount of wear on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. This was stand for cobalt chrome conventional polyethylene. All the other knees out there have what's called cobalt chrome. Okay, that's their articulating surface on the femur. If you look at a cobalt chrome under a microscope, and a zirconium under a microscope, the zirconium is much smoother, so there's less wear with this. Now, this is the amount of wear you'll see in a million cycles. By cross-linking the plastic, we have shown a 73% reduction in wear. That's significant. Now, if we also add the zirconium or the oxinium metal, we see an additional, was it 4%? Or is it, I can't even read it. 79%? Six, yeah. Okay, so we go down to 79% decreased wear with that. So you see we see improvement in the wear um, of this knee. Now what's new in knee replacement surgery? Uh, you'll hear things talk about navigation and computer assisted. Uh, Makoplasty has been used as a robotic arm for partial knee replacements and patient specific instrumentation. Now this is kind of a confusing slide. I'll try to explain this as best I can. But this is like using a GPS when we do and use a computer in surgery. A pin is placed in the femur and it has a sensor on the end of that pin. A pin is in place in the tibia, and again, a sensor is placed on that. And our instruments also have a sensor, and this is picked up by a monitor or a tower in the room. So imagine like this is your cell phone, and that's the tower. What we do is we have a pin, and we pretty much kind of paint the inside of the knee that gives the computer the image of that knee. We touch the inside and outside of the ankle, and then we put the hip through a range of motion. All this data is fed into the computer, and this helps guide us in where we put our cuts and our, our instrumentation. Now, so far in the studies, there's been no significant difference in the outcome of these patients who've had a computer-assisted knee or someone who's um, just did a total knee the way we routinely, re routinely do this. There's increased OR time in doing these procedures. And with the contraction of healthcare dollars and the cost related to this, this is going to become more and more difficult to do a computer-assisted knee. And many times when you talk to surgeons about a computer system knee, sometimes they don't really trust what they're seeing on the computer. A macoplasty or a maco partial knee, this is only for partial knees. It uses a robotic arm to help do the total knee. The robotic arm has a burr on it. You get a CT scan preoperatively, and you also have to navigate the knee, and pretty much you just kind of push this burr around the knee, and it turns on where it's supposed to cut and turns off where it's not supposed to cut. And you can see it on the monitor. You actually see the knee, and it shows the green areas where you're supposed to cut. Patient-specific instrumentation, OK? We get a standing x-ray from the hip to the ankle and an MRI of the knee for data. Then a 3D printer, printer actually prints out these cutting blocks for us to use in surgery. This does decrease OR time and decrease blood loss with this. It is an increased cost for this. This is what it looks like. These are the actual cutting blocks. This is of the femur. These little holes here is where we pin the cutting block in place, and this slot here is where we make our cut. This is the tibia. Again, pin it here, and this is where we make our cuts. This is the cadaver. It shows you how these blocks are on a cadaver knee and a tibia. Just this month, an article came out in, our, in the Journal of Bone and Joints that compared total knees using patient-specific implants or instrumentation and standard instrumentation. And what was interesting, they saw an increased malalignment in the tibial slope with the patient-specific total knees. And the reason I think this is so is because it's pretty hard to fit that tibial cutting block on the tibia. The femur is very easy, but the tibia is a little tricky. Indications for this, I think if someone's got a broken femur, when we do a total knee, we put a rod up the femur. And off that rod, we make our cuts. If someone has a broken femur, in the past that hasn't healed correctly, that's gonna throw our cuts off. If they have hardware in their femur, again, we can't put that rod up their femur. Obesity makes it very hard, sometimes use traditional instrumentation to do a total knee. And if we're doing bilateral cases, I think this is a good indication because it's much quicker and less blood loss. 
This is an example of a patient that I had who was, as a kid, uh, was hit by a car, had an open distal femur fracture. He had a broken bone in this general area where the bone was sticking out, got infected, had multiple surgeries. If you look at this little round spot right there, that can be at a sequestrum or a nidus of infection that's still remaining in his bone that's quiescent. When if I do a total knee and I put a rod up his femur, I can reactivate that infection and open that thing up. So I don't want to put anything up his femur. So I felt this was a good indication to use the patient-specific instrumentation. Here's the lateral view, and again, you can see that one area there. So I didn't have to violate his femur at all, and you can see the alignment of the knee. Now, probably the most common question I get is, when should I have surgery? Uh, I think you always got to try conservative treatment. And I always ask patients just how painful a knee is. Everybody's tolerance to pain is different. And you've got to look at your quality of life. How does this affect your lifestyle? And I always tell patients, you'll know when it's time to have surgery. Thank you. Osteoporosis may affect how you fix the implants to the bone. If you see someone who's got a very thin-looking bone, osteoporosis is thinning of the bones. It really has nothing to do with the joint itself. So what we may do is we may put a stem on the implant to further fix down the bone. You saw that one x-ray I showed of a knee implant that I put a stem down that. That's common in someone who's got an a, um, osteoporotic bone that we need better fixation down the bone itself. An osteophyte is your body's mechanism of trying to immobilize the joint. It's trying to solve the problem of the arthritic joint. With movement of an arthritic joint, it hurts. So your body forms these bone spurs to limit the motion. That's why we form bone spurs. Now, just removing a bone spur doesn't cure the problem. The problem is in the weight-bearing portion of the articular cartilage that is absent. That kind of depends on the tear itself. Um, I've done many, many meniscal tears, and it seems like every time I look at a meniscus, it looks different. And patient's pain tolerance to it and the mechanical symptoms of the knee, I think it's very patient-specific. When I do see patients that the pain is not that bad, I do think it's reasonable to try physical therapy. Um, most meniscal tears, when they first happen, cause a very significant inflammatory reaction, and they're very painful. And usually when they come to me in the first week and I see them and we, they want to MRI their knee, they think they got a meniscus tear, and they go get their MRI, and they come back to me about three weeks later. And most patients actually feel better by just giving it time. And it's amazing how many people think that the MRI cured their knee. <laughs> what happens is that the inflammation settles down. It takes some anti-inflammatories and it settles down. And a lot of these things, you can wait up to three months and see how patients do, and many patients will get better in that period of time. So you don't need to run out to get a, an MRI. I do see some patients that come in, they can't sleep at night, they can't function, they need to do something about it. Those are the ones that, you know, maybe an MRI, maybe physical therapy if you're looking for non-operative treatments, but it is possible you can use that. We have seen some antibiotics actually cause tendon ruptures. Yeah, minimally invasive, you know, people always think about it's the length of incision is what is minimally invasive. And I always tell patients it's not the length of incision that you make, it's what you do under the skin that makes it minimally invasive. So you want to be doing, you know, less dissection of the tissues and taking down of the soft tissues when you go into the knee. So, yes, we do tend to make smaller incisions for more cosmetics, but it's what you do under the skin that makes it more of a minimally invasive procedure. Um, loose ligaments usually cause instability. Uh, they rarely cause pain. Now, this, I'm speaking of a chronic injury to a knee. Someone who has an acute ligament injury to a knee, like a medial collateral ligament, is very painful. But over time, it usually does not become painful. The knee becomes unstable. Uh, ACL injuries are very common injuries that we see. And again, they tend not to cause pain. They cause instability. I mean, you have to take care of yourself in good health, eat healthy, you know, and balanced diet, exercise, and I think those are just the main things you can do. Uh, look at maybe taking calcium to help maintain your bone health, uh, not smoking, and 
those are kind of the basic things I could see for your joint health. But um, there's no specific thing that we can say if you do this, you will offset osteoarthritis.